Us with you this morning, we'd ask that you turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. Luke, chapter 13, and we're going to begin reading in verse 6. Uh, while you're turning there, I forgot to mention that our Sarah is, uh, she's in church right now up in East Kentucky with Sean Berry family, but she'll be headed home uh, right after their services. So if you would pray for her in her travels and uh, that she arrive home safe. The Gospel of Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, He spake unto them this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyards, and he come and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, find, and find none. Cut it down, while cumbereth it the ground. And he answering said unto the, at him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Mm. Dear Lord, we thank you, and we praise you for your book. Lord, we thank you for the Gospels that uh, preach Christ unto us, Lord, and point to who he is. God, we pray this morning that you would allow us to look at our own lives, Lord, that you would look at what we bear and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, I'll be preaching this morning uh, on just another year. Uh, we are about to end up one more year. we got about three weeks, and we'll be done with 2022. And if you're like me, uh, wondering sometime uh, at the will of God that we're even still here, but that is committed to him. Every year I think, well, maybe this will be the year. This will be the year uh, that we're swept away and then the year comes and goes and we're not. And what I've come to believe and come to see, that should not be our focus. That is in the hand of the Almighty. When he's coming is his business and his business alone. Uh, one day, God the Father, the great God Jehovah, will look to his son and say, it's enough. And then Jesus will come to catch us away. And until then, our, our focus ought to be being fruitful. Now, a uh, very familiar parable, and if you kind of uh, uh, know where this is located in the scriptures, he had just had uh, an issue uh, with... Uh, some Galileans and some uh, more or less the Jews as always trying to find fault in him and trying to find problems with him and then they leave and he, say, and he says to his disciples alone the others have left in other words this part of the word wasn't good for the lost uh, they didn't deserve it they didn't need it and so he says to his apostles this a certain man had a fig tree, and a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Amen. Now, I want you to see from the very beginning, the owner of the figs was in control. He had an individual go and plant a new tree. And even today, and we're 2,000 years plus from the ministry of Christ, and you know what? He's still putting fig trees out. He is still saying, you go to that place and start a church. You go to that place and spread the gospel. He's still putting fig trees out, uh, and he still anticipates a reward. Now, when we belittle God's grace down to the point that all it is is saving your soul and, and, and nothing happens after that, We've defeated, in essence, the purpose of God. The purpose of God is to have fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's what he desires from us. That's it's his expectation from us, is that we will bear fruit. And so uh, it says a certain man had a fig tree, uh, had, and uh, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his garden, and he came... So, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Now, 
Now, I've often thought, how many times has the Lord inspected you and found none? Mm. And this became an annual event, a yearly thing, in the fig bearing season. He went down three years consistently and said, Where's the fruit? Now, I don't know much about fig trees at all, uh, but I do know a little bit of apple, about apple trees. And apple trees, it takes seven years to get the first harvest. And, and that is a long time to wait. I don't know if fig trees are singular, what the, what the growth rate is, how long it has to be before you anticipate that fruit will come. But I know there's an, intent, there's an expected wait but this tree had out, outlived that. Uh, in other words, when there should be good things growing, there were none. Now, there's not a believer under the sound of my voice this morning that he doesn't anticipate fruit from. And he comes annually, he comes more than annually, and he checks us out and he looks from fruit. That's why in another parable, the Lord said that some of that bear 30, some 60, and some 100. It's because why? How would he know that if he wasn't looking? He's anticipating you to bear fruit. And from a, a, a worthless gospel, that is not given. From a gospel that has uh, no feet, no, no platform on the blood of Christ, this is not real. And so only you can really answer what fruit you have bore this year. Only you can say, well, it's not been the best year, or it's been a good year. It's been a year that the Lord has helped me. It's been a year that I can share the gospel numerous times. It's been, it's been that kind of year. So the Lord of the vineyard came, nothing was there. Verse 7, he's not, uh, he's not careful about his judgment. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Now, I want you to see it had nothing else to do with the orchard. It was just that one fig tree. You know, sometimes when we're in a good church and things are being accomplished from the Lord, uh, we may feel exempt because things are going well. Well, what I do and what New Testament church does has nothing to do with what you do personally. You're responsible for your own figs. You are responsible for the fruit that you bear. You are responsible to give back to the Lord annually on a routine basis. And so, uh, obviously, this was probably some kind of orchard uh, because he had a dresser and... This one tree was the problem. This one tree was the difficulty. Then, his, then the command to the dresser, cut it down. What cumbereth it the ground? In other words, why is it taking up space? You know, that, that's a pretty harsh language from God the Father, but remember God the Father is the one that is strict the one that is down the line, where there is no gray areas, where there is uh, no forgiveness because he's holy. He, he's fully righteous in every way. This is a waste of space. You know, uh, yeah. sometimes I feel the same way about myself. Mm -hmm. Just taking up room. Just breathing air. Uh, but I want you to see the dresser intervene. Now, your intervention is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your dresser. He's the one that cares for you. He's the one that knows that you can bear fruit. He's the one that anticipates fruit from you. And he, said, he intervenes and says, Let me, give, give me one more year. Give me one more year, and I'm going to loosen the soil around it. I'm going to dig around it. I'm going to put some dung around it. And if it bears fruit, good. Give me one more year. Isn't it a wonderful thing if you think about the years when you were genuinely saved, but you weren't serving the Lord that he said, give, give him one more year. Mm -hmm. 
give him one more year. Let, let me work with him, and we'll see what happens. And that's the goodness. That's the person. The dresser is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that intervenes on our behalf. He's the one that uh, gives us more time, and he is the one that makes us fruitful. Now, we uh, every year, uh, Donna's real good with her garden, and she puts leaves out there, and uh, we have compost heap that the girls keep, mostly Sarah, and uh, we put that out there, and we put droppings from the chickens out there, and uh, so, but you know what? It's not pleasant to think about having dung thrown on you. Now, if you're a tree, maybe it's okay. But if you're a person, it's not too pleasant of a thought. But you know what? I bet if somebody throws something like that at you, it'd get your attention, don't you? Uh -huh. See, being, being dunged as a Christian may not be pleasant. It may not be an experience that you want to repeat annually. It may not be something that, oh, this is great. I'm glad the Lord did it for me. But I'll guarantee you this, it will get your attention. Mm -hmm. it, it, it will make you stop and take note and say, you know what? The Lord, uh, the Lord is dealing with me about being unfruitful. And so he, does, he makes that intervention. In verse 9, he gives us the last portion of this. And if it bear fruit, well. Now, I want you, if you underline in your Bible, it says, and if it bear fruit well. I want you to see it did not say if it bear fruit extraordinary. If it bear fruit, that's going to blow me away. If it bear fruit, we're going to have a party. That's just minimal well. But then he said, if it don't, then I'll cut it down. You know what? I, I genuinely believe I have new people, I have known people that were cut down. That truly they were taken away simply because they were so useless when it came to the things of the Lord. Now, let me say this, and then we're going to move on to the next part of the year, that that happens only to the redeemed. It don't happen to, you know, lifelong drunks that made a little profession when they were five and wrapped it around a tree when they were older and, and drunk as Cootie Brown. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about faithful people that never did one thing for the cause of Christ. And those people are like, are like this fig tree and... We never know the destiny of this fig tree. We never know what happened on the next year. We never know if it responded to the Lord's intervention. But we do know this, it could have. And we do know the fate if it didn't. So what fruits have you bore this year? We as the Lord's people, we are directed to bear fruit all the time. And a lot of times we think about that in other souls and other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, if the Lord saves someone, we can't take credit for that. We can certainly say, we can certainly share the gospel, but at that point, it's up into the Lord God Almighty what he does with it. So what did you do in 2022 in the, in the work of Christ and, and what he does and, and what he what he would uh what he accomplished through you. What, what was the, what was the uh, emphasis? Now go with me back to 1 Samuel. And uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, Samuel, I mean, excuse me, Saul that got into a real bad mess. Uh, 1 Samuel 28. And we're going to just read the, ver the first seven verses. 1 Samuel 28 in... The very first verse. First Samuel chapter 28 in the first verse. And it came to pass in those days, the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare. To fight with Israel, and Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle thou and thy men. 
Now, I want you to see, if you look back on 2022, that in many ways it's been a year of battle, a, a year of difficulty, a, a year where new problems have risen up, uh, a, a year where in the Far East, in Russia, uh, in the Ukraine, where war has broken out again, difficulty on every hand. It's not been an easy year. And very much uh, Saul was having one of those times. Uh, he was having one of those years that were not so good. And they had been followed year after year after year after year. And if you really study the, the events of your Bible, uh, David Bennett had been on the run for nine years. And Saul had been his chaser. Uh, you, you don't want to spend nine years against God's man. You don't, want to spend, you don't want to spend 15 minutes in that condition. But you know what? If we're not very careful as God's people, we can wind up in that situation. And, and so we find David, I mean, excuse me, Saul, year after year after year, was in worse shape instead of better. In other words, his fruit yield was down to nothing. He, he was not near unto the Lord at all. He was not close to him. The rest of that verse, I uh, mean, verse 2 says, And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, um, Therefore will I make the keeper of mine head forever. Now, Samuel was dead. Now, what was significant about that, they no longer had God's man on the place. You know, uh, a few of you come to me for advice, and about all I can ever say, and if you have, all, you, you know that's true, I will say the Bible says this. And sometimes it's good news, and sometimes it's bad news. Sometimes it doesn't leave you many options that you like. But I want you to see that's more or less what was going on here. That man that they could seek advice from was gone. No longer available. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul put out away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Now, I want you to see that uh, Saul does this seemingly very righteous act in putting out witches and warlocks and people that, that try to predict the future. He puts them out of the land on the death of Samuel. Um, that sounds good. And you know, sometimes in a year's time, we do things that sound good and look good, but have no heartfelt, no spirit-led action behind them. You know what that is? It's a useless fruit. That's the kind the Lord will come by, the Lord of the harvest will come by and says, that's not fit to eat. And that's exactly what Saul was doing. It was for show. It, it, it was to look good. It, it was to uh, it, it, it was to impress others. Verse four. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all of the Israel together, and they get, get and they pitched in Gaboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. Now, if you'll follow the life of Saul, time and time again, fear was his biggest enemy. Even though he literally stood head and shoulders above everyone else, fear kept him at grips at all times. If you remember, uh, because of his stature, they thought, oh, this is our king. And if you remember, whenever, even when they found him, he was running. He had went to find some kind of sheep or something of his father's, and he wasn't even doing good at that. He was kind of hiding. And he was fearful even then. You know what 2023 is going to bring you? Fear. Uncertainty. 
not sure what's next on your plate, I can assure you, but I can also say this, that fear will be conquered by grace and, and by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ if you genuinely trust him. See, uh, Saul was not genuine in this. He was not sincere in throwing out the witches. He was not sincere in, in getting rid of those that had uh, familiar spirits and tried to divine the future. He just wanted to look good. Verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now, I want you to see the situation he finds him in, he finds himself in, is that he's not hearing from God. Now, that I can say most assuredly, I have, I have been there, I have experienced that, and it's a very sore place to be for a child of God. Now, I don't know that, uh, I don't know that Saul was ever even genuinely saved. I, I, I tumbled that back and forth in my mind, and I guess it's not for me to know. But and at the very least, you have a child of God that's not hearing from God, and that's a miserable place to be. See, what I want for 2023 is to hear from God. Uh, what I want to do is know the, His will for my life. That, that, that is the situation where I would like to, affi uh, to find myself. And, and so we find, what are you going to do with that? And this is why I'm not sure that Saul was a saved man. Me and Brother Downs, uh, we, we would go back and forth across this because th th this was Brother Downs' uh, summation of Saul. He says he's a type of the Antichrist. And that, that was his idea uh, of who Saul was and that David was likened to a type of Christ. So th th there's that for you to give you something to chew on this week. But I do know this, if he was saved, God wasn't hearing him anymore. You know, that has to be a very scary place to live. That, that has to be. And you know what? As I said, I've experienced it. When I'm out of the, you know what? He's not going to bless you with his presence and with his answers to your questions when you're not in his will. Now, he was chasing David with everything he had. His intent, even whenever he arranged this marriage between his daughter, Michelle, and, and David, it was just so he could keep tabs on David. That, that's all that that was about. And, and so we find that he has went in this situation for nine years searching for David, looking for David, and after this, this is his spiritual condition. He cannot hear from God. And that, that is who he is. So what's he going to do? Verse 6, And Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that have a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, There is a woman that have a familiar spirit at Endor. Now, first of all, I want you to see the law is just a schoolmaster. It has never been honored. Because you know what? We see in verse 4, Saul had just made an edict to get rid of all those people. And everybody knew there was still one down at Endor. See, religion is not by law. Reli the law did not accomplish anything but describing our filth. That's what the law did. And, and in the very same way, we can see it even in Saul's life, so simplistically, he said, get rid of the witches, get rid of the soothsayers, and now he's looking for one and knowing full well they were still around. That is who we are. Verse 8, and Saul disguised himself 
Now, let me say this. If you have to disguise yourself to go somewhere, you don't need to be there. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went. And two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. If you have to do it at night, it's probably not a place you need to be. And he said, I pray thee, divine me by familiar spirit, and bring him up. And who to up whom I shall name unto thee? And the woman said, Behold, thou knowest what Saul had done, and he had cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Therefore, then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul swear by her, uh, and, and Saul and Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying. As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And the woman saw Samuel, and she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? Thou art Saul. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. This is where he's at. Uh, he's not hearing from God, so he switches to religion. Now, despite what you may think, witchcraft is real. It is a religion. Uh, false prophets are out there, and, and, and you know, they can make things happen, I guess, if you want to say it that way. I mean, uh, there is some kind of ungodly power present that they use. And, and, and they're, uh, because they're here, his, they can use it. And, and so we find this is Saul's situation, asking the devil himself for the knowledge of God. That is an impossibility. In nine years, this is where he came to. You know what? Nine years from now, I will be 63 years old. I want something better than that in nine years. I want to be closer unto the Lord nine years from now than I am today. I want it to be a better relationship then than now. And you know what? That doesn't happen on accident. That is not a, circum, a circumstance that just happens. It's something that we have to work on. It, it is like uh, uh, digging about the fig tree and dumping the nutrients in. It only happens by, by focusing on the Lord, exposing yourself to preaching, reading the Word of God. We need every bit of that if 2023 is going to be any better than 2022. It takes spiritual effort. And, and so we see that, uh, that uh, Saul was in a mess. Now go me to Exodus. Exodus chapter number three, very familiar verses of scripture. And uh, we're just going to read a couple of places here. Exodus chapter three. And when Moses meets the Lord, Exodus chapter 3 in the first verse, the Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, he, uh, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now they, uh, Moses is in a mess. He's running from God. He's running from uh, the prince or the king of uh, Egypt. And he finds himself on the backside of the desert. Now, I knew nothing about deserts, and I'm assuming something was out there. But it makes no uh, logical sense to me. If I'm feeding cows, why would I take them to a desert? I would take them to somewhere where there was grass, right? Uh, so I have to get, get the idea that Moses wasn't even good at that. And, and the reason he wasn't good at it is that he wasn't in the will of God. 
He, he wasn't following what God would have him to do. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, <laughs> why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he says, Draw nigh, nigh hither, put off thy shoe for the shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, I want you to see, this is when he's 80 years old. He is past his prime, past at what most people would consider anybody useful at all. And here on the back side of the desert, he meets God. Now, y'all know what I believe about this? I believe he was lost. I believe he had religion before, but I believe he was lost as a goose in a hailstorm. He did not know the Lord. He did not understand. And if he did, God the Father wouldn't say, I am, I am the God of Jacob and Israel. I, I, I am your father's people. Uh, that is me. And, uh, and so he met the Lord God there on the back side of the desert, and his life was eternally the same. But I want you to see his response to meeting God is very similar to the re uh, response of many of the newly redeemed. He was scared to death. He ran from him. He, he, he dared not look on the face of God. Now, 40 years later, go with me. Uh, to Deuteronomy. Forty years later, in Deuteronomy 34. Now, I don't know, there's many of us under the sound of my voice that don't remember 40 years ago. There's some of us <laughs> that that exceeds their timeline. Uh, Forty years ago, Joey was four. Forty years ago, I was 14. I had known the Lord only two years. And you know what? I didn't know enough about Him then to even follow Him. I listened to ungodly music. I wore things that were not pleasing to the Lord. I did things that were not pleasing to the Lord 42 years ago. And probably could not have been identified out of a whole group of a believer any more than anyone else. And so that was Moses in the beginning. And this is going to be Moses in Deuteronomy 40 years later. Uh, and Moses went up from the plains of Moab under the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, and the city of the palm trees unto Zor. And the Lord said unto him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Now, what happened in this 40 years was to the better and was to the better and to the better. Two key points during those 40 years. Uh, number one, he got the law. Uh, and remember, he begged, Lord, let me just see you. And he says, no man can see me and live. But he said, I'll put my hand on you, and you can see my hundred parts. 
And what an unbelievable experience. It says that he came down and after that day forward forevermore, he glowed because he'd been so close to the presence of God. And here at the end of his life, they're walking like old friends and said, I'm going to let you look over there. You can't go in because you sin, but I'm going to let you look over there. And then God buried him. He went home to be with the Lord and God buried him. That's an incredible 40 years. That, that's something that we ought to aspire to. I, I want to be closer to the Lord next year this time than I am now, but that doesn't happen by accident. That doesn't happen by just throwing it out there and seeing what will happen. That comes from focusing on the Lord. Every problem that Moses ever had in the rebellion of the children of Israel, he took immediately to the Lord. And sometimes he got good news and sometimes he got bad news. Sometimes they said, sometimes the Lord said, get up, Moses. What doest thou here? And then other times he gave them very specific instructions on what to do next. You know what? If we're having difficulty in 2023, look into the Lord. I'm assuring you, He will give you direction. He will tell you what to do next. Unless you're unless you're out of His will, and then He may tell you to get up <laughs> and uh, move on. Mm. We uh, we don't get there by happenstance. We get there by work.